our dear viewers and welcome to a new edition of our program Africa Today. Foreign Minister and COP27 uh, President uh, Samah Shukri reiterated the significance of enacting a groundbreaking agreement to provide loss and damage funding for vulnerable nations severely affected by the climate disasters. This was stated in a speech that was recorded at the opening of the first formal gathering of the COP27 Transitional Committee on funding for the vulnerable communities affected by the climate disasters. More details in the following story. Foreign Minister and President of the 27th session of the UN Climate Change Conference COP27, Sameh Shukri, has affirmed the importance of activating a breakthrough agreement to provide loss and damage funding for vulnerable countries hit hard by climate disasters. This came in a recorded speech during the inauguration of the first official meeting of the Transitional Committee of the COP27 on funding for vulnerable communities hit by climate disasters being held in Luxor from March 27th to 29th to prepare for establishing the Loss and Damage Fund. Shukri shed light on the climate phenomena, which threaten many world countries, especially African states and other developing countries. The Foreign Minister pointed to a report issued by Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, warning that the worsening climate crisis would triple and the economic burdens of countries by 2050. He expressed support for COP28 due to be held in the United Arab Emirates later this year. For his part, UN Climate Change Executive Secretary Simon Steele said that the committer task is to protect the lives of millions of people who suffer from the bad effects of climate change and to find mechanisms to finance the loss and damage fund. He added that the Transitional Committee, established during the Sharm el Sheikh's conference and consisting of 24 countries, 14 of which are developing countries and 10 advanced countries, is anticipated to issue recommendations on the structure of the Loss and Damage Fund during COP28 in the UAE with the goal of identifying funding mechanisms. Foreign Minister Najda El Magush has stated that the meeting of Western and Eastern military security forces with Tripoli hosted is a positive sign of the ability of the Libyans to unite in order to create the conditions for holding elections. El Magush tweeted that the efforts of the UN mission to bring points of view together coincide with the conviction of the government of the national unity in the ability of the Libyans to produce a political and peaceful solution, adding that they encourage the continuation of meetings between the Libyans inside of Libya. A Libyan-Libyan meeting in Tripoli has reached a consensus on unifying all state institutions and creating a unified government in the country. This came in a statement issued on Monday at the end of the meeting, which was attended by 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission and a number of commanders of military and security units in Tripoli. In addition, the special representatives of UN Secretary General to Libya. The statement also said that the dialogue should be Libyan-Libyan and inside Libyan territory, rejecting foreign interference in Libyan affairs and complying fully with all that resulted from the dialogue between military and security leaders with the military committee in its first meeting in Tunis and second in Tripoli. The statement also called for renouncing all forms of fighting and violence on Libyan soil, increasing efforts to solve the problems of the displaced and those affected by fighting and wars, completing national reconciliation efforts and providing reparation and proceeding with the elections. It urged the House of Representatives and the Supreme Council of the state to complete the measures entrusted to them and that the next meeting be held in Benghazi during Ramadan. The UN mission pointed in its statement that the meeting included a number of military and security unit commanders in the western, eastern and southern regions. During the meeting, they discussed the role of the military and security institutions in providing an environment conductive to pushing the political process and holding free and fair elections in 2023. 
Getting a professional polishing of the family copper before the Islamic holy months of Ramadan is a long-held custom in Tunisia, but it's unfortunately a dying art. More details. The eve of Ramadan is a frantic time for Tunisian coppersmith Chidli Magrohi, who skillfully puts a new shine on family's favorite kitchenware before the Muslim holy month starts. From couscous pots to beloved tea sets, the meltware gets a professional polish from the 69-year-old craftsman who labors away solo at his workshop in the old city of Tunis. Magruhi scrubs items and uses a method known as hot dip tinning, where he coats the copper with a thin layer uh, of tin to stop metal oxidation, a process that makes spots gleam like new. As he reconditions one well-loved pewter piece, he fans an oven fire that heats a pot with the object inside before brushing it and plunging it into a large bucket of water. Magrohi says he is proud to be among the few still practicing the time-honored craft in the ancient North African country, adding that it is a tradition that has existed from centuries and it's still alive. Tunisian women often receive copper or white copper gifts when they get married or inherit the items from their mothers. Many bring their beloved heirlooms to Magruhi to protect them a little longer. Saneh Bukhris, a Tunisian accountant, said that she gets a special feeling when she uses her shiny pot during Ramadan. The tradition reminds her of good times as a child when her mother would prepare for the holy month. Daria Bukir, a housewife, said she could only afford to get two pots polished up for Ramadan this year as the households across Tunisia struggle with inflation and high unemployment. Abiji Ayari, who has worked as a coppersmith in the Medina for 48 of his 60 years, said the run-up to Ramadan was intense this year. He said that people prepare to have their kitchenware treated before Ramadan, so it looks in couple for the whole month, so the kitchen looks good and women enjoy their pots. Trade is also brisk for beautiful old pieces in the Souq al Nahes or copper market, where around 50 shops sell coffee makers, teapots, incense burners, and small cups. Mabrouk Rodhain, who at the age of 82 owns three such stores in the market in the heart of the Medina, said that demand is so high that they are not taking orders anymore. Ayari said he learned the trade from his father and started before he was even a teenager, but he now worries that the few young people want to follow in his footsteps. Indeed, uh, the holy month of Ramadan uh, carries many different customs and traditions across countries and regions. Each country has its own unique customs which became part of the culture of people who create their own characteristics for the month. To shed more light on uh, the uh, preparations and the traditions of Ramadan in Africa, we are very much uh, delighted to be joined over the phone by Shabira uh, Nakizito. She is an Azhar researcher. Uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you too. Um, to start with, uh, happy Ramadan. Yeah. Yes, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yes, uh, and uh, Muslims around the world are celebrating the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, did uh, the uh, celebration uh, here in Egypt uh, uh, seem different to you from uh, those uh, in your homeland of Uganda? Yeah, it, it's very different because uh, uh, since Egypt is a Muslim country, it's very different. People try, it, it's very delightful here. More than in my country in Uganda because Uganda is not a Muslim country, yeah. so it it makes they are Muslims and non-Muslims. So it's not like here. Uh, here people people just try to decorate everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's already decorated, showing that really it's Ramadan. So here it's very delightful than in Uganda. Yes, uh, what are the uh, traditions that you do have in Uganda during uh, Ramadan as a non-Muslim country? Uh, what do you do? What are the traditions? What are uh, the family uh, gathering, the uh, religious um, uh, tradition that you do practice? Uh, how, how do you do uh, things in Uganda during Ramadan? Uh, since this, this holy month, everyone wants to earn a lot of rewards. So a lot of people from my country 
Uh, some people who own their houses, like private houses, they try to open their gates for everyone to come in during the iftar time so that they can break their fast. Oh. And in each masjid, in, in, every, in every mosque, they try every day to when Ramadan finishes, yeah. they try to, to organize iftar for people. Yeah. Even non-Muslims, they try mm. to come and eat. They don't trust them away because they're non-Muslim or what, no. And they like it so much in Ramadan because people are starving, maybe people are poor, they will get food, they will get what to eat, they will get food on the table, yeah. Yes. Um, how do you uh, eat during Ramadan? What are your traditions? Do, do you have specific uh, uh, food that you do, uh, traditional food that you do eat during the holy months of Ramadan? Do you have uh, special desserts like here, uh, kunafa, ataif? Do, do you have these traditions in your homeland? Uh, no, no, not really in my home because it, it depends on in which family because families differ. But probably there, there are some, some, some things which are really very common like in every home or everywhere where people are breaking the fast. Like, for mm. example, here maybe uh, the, the difference that I can say uh, here I'm witnessing, witnessing people, maybe they, if it's time for Easter, they eat once and it's finished. But in my country it's very different because people will break their fast mm. um, with different kinds of fruits and with um, fast food, like breaking their fast, then they'll go for tower prayer and after praying, then they'll come back and eat, uh, and eat heavy food. So that's how they do it. Yes. How uh, do you see uh, these uh, occasions, like uh, the holy months of Ramadan, like the, the greater Bairam, the lesser Bairam, and other uh, occasions do um, uh, create more closer ties between the different African nations, uh, Shabira? Come again with a question, please. Yes, how do you see the events like, uh, or uh, the occasions like Ramadan and Eid uh, influencing the ties between uh, the different uh, African states? I, I, what I can say about that is that uh, Ramadan uh, is a gift that Allah blesses to the world. And mm. you can look at Ramadan, uh, it's because it's, uh, when we look in Africa, the, the, the crime rate in Africa is very high, right? So yes. uh, during Ramadan, it's, it's mm. really a privilege and it's really a gift that Allah blesses us with. Because mm. during Ramadan, uh, the crime rate is very low in African countries. It's very low. So there's, there's protection. Allah knows best about that, but there's protection because everyone, even if someone is not a Muslim, someone will be like, no, I can't do this, I can't do that. Because, mm. I don't know, it's, there, there's magic in it. There's magic. Allah knows best how he did that. But because yes. during Ramadan, the crime rate is very low and people are, are very peaceful. Everything is very peaceful. The prices mm. are very normal. Like, not like other days. Like, like um, other days, maybe the prices of the things are very high and people, everyone has different price. But during Ramadan, people, they, they'll give a, a uniform a uniform price and mm. everything there will be peace that's what i can say mm. what are uh, the cultural differences that you did witness uh, uh, shabira uh, in the different uh, states here in egypt in uganda and uh, in any other country that you did visit during ramadan did you see the difference here between the celebrations uh, the Ramadan lantern here in egypt and some traditions that we do practice as well and we do uh, have Moed uh, Rahman uh, or uh, the uh, tables um, uh, that uh, the uh, fasting people do eat on sometimes. So, so do you see that in your homeland as well or in other African states that you did visit? Okay, about, about that, there, there's not much difference because if you look at uh, the way Muslims try to conduct mm. their things, it's almost yes. the same, but the only difference I can say because here in my, uh, in my country, uh, people own land. People own land. People own private houses. That yes. is the difference here. Because we have a, a few people who own uh, private houses here. So uh, you can find in my country every house is, is open. Like every, every house you go to is open. You, you don't need to be invited. If, if it's time for breaking the fast, yeah. automatically the, the, it will be showing that here the, the, they're serving food. They are serving a style for people. So, and here it's very different. But like maybe uh, they can try to organize somewhere uh, where people can break the fast. Mm. But it's, it's very hard here to, to enter into or pop into someone's house. Mm. So that is the only difference. It's very small, yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you see the role of religion here, uh, Shabira, in bringing countries closer? Uh, the, the religious people? The, the role the of religion. Oh, yeah. The religion has that much in bringing people closer in the way that because if people don't, don't fear God, if people don't have that in their heart, 
It's very hard because people, they do without caring. There's nothing guiding you because you can look at every country, even if someone is Muslim or non-Muslim, there are rules governing the, governing the country. Why? Because they're avoiding a lot of things. They have to be the rules governing them. So when you look at Islam, bringing people closer, uh, someone, the yes. poor or the rich, they will look equal. Someone will fear Allah. In the fear of Allah, someone will do the right thing, will not overlook the poor person, that this one's poor or something is not, is not real, maybe is not my life or something like that. So Islam makes people be equal. Islam creates uh, peace mm. between people. Yeah. Yes. Shabira, you have been in Egypt here uh, for how long? I'm going to raise two years, inshallah. Yes. So uh, what were the most important and distinctive uh, things that you did witness here uh, during the holy months of Ramadan? And it did the touch you, uh, you as a person here uh, living in Egypt uh, for now? And, the, and I like them ab about Egypt? Yes, uh, especially during Ramadan. Yeah. Uh, as, as, as I told you first that I come from a, uh, a non-Muslim country, so being here is something very privileged. Like, for example, mm -hmm. taking public means, pub public transport. So it, it's like witnessing people, everything they do, it's, they bring Allah first. That makes me feel good mm -hmm. in that. And besides that, if people will be merciful to each other, like everything someone will do, because it's Ramadan, it's very peaceful. And being the, the country, a Muslim country, everywhere I look, it's, it's really decorated, really showing how mm -hmm. well can how warm welcoming they are for the Ramadan. So I like that about that. It's really, mm. it's really very nice. I like it about it. Yes. Uh, um, Shabira, you are a, a, a researcher at Al-Azhar. Uh, to what extent you are seeing here the role of Al-Azhar in bringing together uh, the uh, African students along with the Egyptian and Arab students together, they are uh, creating um, uh, a smaller uh, community, if I might say, or they are bridging any gaps here uh, between uh, the different Al-Azhar students and scholars. How do you see that, uh, Shabira, and how do you see the Africa, uh, the Azhar role in Africa? Uh, for that, I can say it's not only in Africa. I can say uh, it's on the, on, the, on the world scale. That's what I can say. It's mm. on the world scale. Because it's not only, if you look at Azhar, may Allah bless him, uh, it's, it's not only the, the, the students from, from Africa, because when you look at Azhar, the, the different students from different continents of the world, from mm. Europe, from Asia, from everywhere. Yes. So you can, you can see that maybe if you, you're back home, like maybe in your country, you can think maybe, maybe you can think maybe Egyptians, the Ulema Egyptians are very high in the aim. Maybe these ones are better than these ones. But mm. he has tried much to unite the students and they study and they know the aim. There is no difference that maybe someone can think of that maybe someone coming from this country is better than someone coming from this country. So he yes. unites people and, know, and they know that the aim, once you study, it's all about giving you the efforts and looking, looking for the knowledge. But it's not about like this yes. is better than that. Yeah, it unites all people. Yes. Finally, Shabira, what is so unique that you do see in your country, Uganda, during Ramadan that you are missing and you like others to go and see? Uh, I can say, I can say there is much, much that I'm missing because everything, as, you, as I told you, like in the Muslim, yes. uh, Muslim world, most of the things are, very same, are the same. And here, it's, it's more because it's, the, it's, it's, a Muslim, it's, it's a Muslim country. So I can say that um, mm. there is much that I miss. But one thing that I can say, like any, any other person that you miss mm. to break the fast with your family, something mm. like that with your family and friends, and yeah. maybe uh, inviting people to your house and something like that to eat, break the fast, just that. But other things, they're almost the same, like you enjoy the Muslim community, like, yes. yeah, they're all the same. Yes, indeed. Uh, Shabira uh, Nakizitu, uh, Al Azhar researcher from Uganda, thank you so much and happy Ramadan. Our dear uh, viewers, of that we come to the end of this edition of Africa Today. My sister, signing off. Thanks for watching.